final keyword. And we started writing this method get complexity description um, with the eventual goal of returning a string that describes a large number of seconds in a way that's more understandable to people. So not that this is a large number of seconds, but rather than returning and saying it's 130 seconds, we want to be able to say, oh, it's two minutes and 10 seconds. Even that's probably more understandable, right? And if we have like a billion seconds, it's definitely going to be more understandable. So these constants are help us going to do these conversions. Um, and today we're going to focus on um, actually doing the calculation um, and, and the operators we use to, to do this. Um, there's already a method in this class written for us called calculate average time to crack. Um, and it takes a single parameter, which is the seconds per guess, which is also the parameter to the method we're in the middle of defining. And it returns a value as a long because it might be more than 2 billion seconds. Um, and so we can use this method to help us uh, create this description. So going back up to where we left off, after we initialize description to an empty variable, but before we return it, um, we can actually call that other method to help us out. So I'm going to create a local variable of type long called total seconds. Again, we're using a long because it might be more than 2 billion. And then I'm going to call the method calculate average time to crack. And I'm going to pass a, a single parameter which was called up here sec per guess. And it's going to do the calculation for us. Here's, here's the challenge though. I want to call this method, but I know that in general, when we call methods, we call them on variables that reference objects, right? We don't just call a method. And so the question is, what variable do I use? Okay. I, I'm, this method's in the same class as where I am, but I don't, I don't have a Caesar cipher variable that I can say that variable dot calculate average time to crack. So it's natural to feel stuck at this point because we don't know what variable to use. Does anyone remember what special variable we could use here? Yeah, this is, this is where we use this this dot calculate average time to crack. Because to the answer to the question on which object do we want to invoke the calculate average time to crack method, it's this object. It's the one whose method is currently running because we're in the same class. So on this object called calculate average time to crack. This is definitely worth a comment because it's something we get stuck on a lot. One method in a class can invoke another method in the same class. We do it all the time. But sometimes we feel stuck. And so what we need to remember is we invoke the method on this. All right, I thought that was worth sharing. We both need it for this method, but it's also a common thing we get stuck on. Um, Today, we're going to focus on operators. Uh, and the good news is you already know a ton about operators. So here's the terms we use in operators. What I want to focus on today is how the operators in Java um, might go beyond what you're familiar with from like math class. Okay, But the good news is the terminologies all the same. Everything you know in math class applies to Java, okay? So operators, when I use that word, think like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Operators perform operations on one, two, or three operands. You're used to one or two operands, not three operands. Um, there's actually an operator in Java that has three operands. We'll focus on it later. I hope you never use it in your code, um, but for completeness, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, operators perform the operation and return a result, right? You, you use the um, addition operator, it, per it performs the addition and it returns the sum, okay? Operators have a precedence order. That is the order in which operators are evaluated. 
Good news, the precedence order is exactly the same as it is in math class. Um, operators also have something called associativity, which is the order in which operators with the same precedence are evaluated. Good news, it behaves the same as math class. Even better news, like you might be like, I, we don't do associativity in math class. You probably do it without even realizing it. And just what you're used to works out fine, okay? Um, again, we're gonna focus on where things are, are different. So Java has a huge number of operators. These are the ones that we're focused on, just these. So I took the table of Java operators and I condensed it way down to just these few. Um, and I grouped them by their precedent order where precedence one is of the highest precedence, do it first, and four is of the lowest precedence. Some of these might sound strange and unfamiliar, but uh, you definitely know what they are. So even these th strange things like unary minus, like what's up with that? Um, the unary minus operation is just when you put the negative sign in front of a number. That's all that is. When you write negative seven, that's an operator. That negative sign is an operator. It has a single operand, the seven. We call it the unary minus. Um, the associativity is right to left because you put the negative sign to the left of the number. Um, and we always negate the number first before we start doing multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. You do all of this naturally already, okay? Um, multiplication and division has the next highest precedence. There's a new operator here with which you might not be familiar called remainder or mod. Um, we're gonna focus on that today for sure. The next level of precedence is addition and subtraction. I added string concatenation here. That operation uses the same symbol, but it's a different operation, right? It involves a string and it concatenates the string rather than producing a sum. They have the same precedence, however, which is nice because they use the same symbol. And then last, but certainly not least, you might not think of the equal sign, the assignment operator as an operator, but it is. And it has a very low precedence, which is exactly what we want. If we have a line of code that says X equals some big mathematical expression, we want to fully evaluate the some big mathematical expression before we um, assign it to X. So, so I hope what's reassuring here is that this will be familiar. And so what we're gonna focus on today is some of the intricacies of division and this new mod operator, remainder operator here. That's all we're gonna really focus on today. So let's take a look at that. So in my example here, let's say total seconds is 130 seconds. And we wanna be able to report that out is two minutes and 10 seconds. Um, we, need to do an, we need to use some operators to do, this, to do this calculation, do this conversion. And so let's write a little comment block about how we're gonna do the first part of this. We're gonna use what's called integer division to calculate how many whole minutes are in the specified number of seconds. So if we have 130 seconds and I divide it by 60, the answer 2.1666666 isn't very useful. I just wanna know there are two whole minutes. And so I want an operator that performs that. An integer division does exactly that. So integer division, which is like the slash slash operator in Python, integer division discards the remainder. It truncates the value. So if I have the 2.166666, it just returns the value two, throws out, truncates the remainder. But it does not round. If I have the value 7.9999999, that gets truncated to seven, not eight. Unfortunately, unlike Python, Java uses the same symbol, a single slash for both integer division and normal floating point division like you do on your calculator all the time, okay? 
Java has therefore a rule about when it does one type of division versus the other. So this is Java's rule. To be clear, I really wish Java did it like Python, but it doesn't. So Java does integer division when both, not just one, but both operands are integer types. And Java does floating point division, that is keep the whole like fractional part, when one, just one is fine, or both operands are floating point types. One thing I wanna be clear about here is when I use the word integer spelled out, I mean all the integer types, byte, short, int, long, all of them. I mean types that represent integers, whole numbers, not just the int type. And when I use floating point all spelled out like this, I mean all floating point types, floats and doubles, not just float, for example. So, all right, I think we can make this a lot more concrete with an example. So for example, let's do two simple examples here. If we have the line of code, three divided by four, three is an integer literal, four is an integer literal, Therefore, this is gonna do integer division, meaning it does the division, 0 0.75, it truncates it, it throws out the remainder, it equals zero. Because three and four are int literals. This, so using integer division to calculate the whole minutes, super useful. This behavior can lead to a huge pitfall. It is probably the most common pitfall in chapter four, is doing integer division when we don't intend to, right? Maybe we're trying to calculate the average of something and we've added it all up as an integer and we divide by the total number of items or something and it does integer division and it falls apart. Um, maybe we're trying to calculate like a percentage, but our, our values are all integers. And instead of ending up with like 0.73 for 73%, we end up with zero, okay? Um, we get burned by this all the time. So whenever you see this little symbol, this simple looking slash, pause and ask yourself, wait, is this integer division or floating point division? Here's another example. 3.0 divided by four, that does evaluate to 0.75. And the reason is that 3.0, because of the decimal point, is a double literal. So if we want to force floating point division, often we just tack on like a 0 0.0 to make it a double literal to ensure it happens. We'll see there's other ways too, but that's a simple way. All right, so how can we use this in a useful way? Well, let's create a new variable called whole minutes. And we're gonna take total seconds, which could be a really big number, but let's say it's just 130. And we're gonna use integer division and divide it by our final variable, our constant from yesterday called seconds for every minute. So 130 divided by 60 is gonna give us two because we're doing integer division. Oops, seconds plural for every minute. There we go. This gets us part of the way there. If we had 130 seconds, we wanna report back to the user that it's two minutes, but we wanna say it's two minutes and 10 seconds. So we also need how many leftover seconds we have. And that's where we're gonna use this, what might be new new to you, this new operator called the, we're gonna use the modula operator. So it's called the modulo operator. There we go, spell that right. I usually just say mod. I've heard it referred to as the remainder operator. All of those terms are fine. So we're gonna use this operator to calculate how many seconds are left over.
So the mod operator uses this symbol, the percent symbol. There we go. And what that does is it returns the remainder of the division, wow, division operation. To be clear, it's the remainder. It's not like the decimal portion, okay? So when we say 130 mod 60, we don't get back like 0.1666666. We get back 10. So you got to think about like when you were learning like long division and you do like 130 divided by 60 and you're like, oh, it's two remainder 10. We're interested in that remainder part, okay? Um, so just keep that in mind. It's not like a fractional part. Integer division and the mod operator are like peanut butter and chocolate. Like it's a Reese's peanut butter cup in your code. It, they go really, really well together. And so you'll see them paired together all the time. Um, so the mod operator can be very useful when paired with integer division. So just keep that in mind. We'll use that a lot. All right, this is new. This deserves some examples. Let's do the first example together. So if I say seven mod two, and I wanna know what that evaluates to, the way I work through this is I say, okay, seven divided by two is uh, three with a remainder of one. So the result of the mod operator is just the remainder, it's one. I want you all to try one. Type this in your code on your own, don't shout out the answer. So everyone has a little space to think. And then we can hold up fingers to see what the uh, answer is in just a minute. 11 mod 3. No, no, just do it in the comment here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I want you to do it in your head. I don't want you to use the computer to do it. I want to make sure you can do the mod thing. All right, so hold up your fingers. How many... What's our remainder of 11 mod three? Two, yeah, two left over, excellent. All right, let's try another one. Again, try this on your own first so other people can do it. Six mod two. Sometimes we get confused by this one. All right, how much? Six mod two. Hold up your fingers. Yeah, zero, right? Six is evenly divisible by two. There is no remainder. It's zero. All right, one more. Four mod 11. All right, what do we think? What's the remainder? Yeah, it's four. 11 is greater than four. All of it's the remainder, all four. So in addition to using this with conversions, like with div the integer division, we also very frequently use mod two. Uh, mod two is frequently used to test odd evenness. That is, if you have some number mod two or some variable mod two, that variable is odd if the result of the operation is one and it's even if the result is zero. That comes up quite a bit as well. One other interesting note about this, um, this mod operator, this mod operation, I guess, it is at the heart of the algorithms that make modern cryptography work. So the, the, the key operation that lets you have like end-to-end -end encrypted like iMessages or that lets you connect to a website and buy something with your credit card and not have other people steal that credit card over the internet, um, that cryptography that's used, that encryption that's used is based on one-way functions. And these one-way functions at the heart of them are these, this modular operator. Um, so cool connection there to like cybersecurity. We study like exact, there's a little more math to it than that, but we like, that's something we study in cybersecurity. Yeah. So in, um, can you only for the first operator, or not operator, what's the variable, I guess? Um, can you only put um, integer numbers? 
Oh, like, can we do the mod operator with, like, d- doubles? Yeah. We can. And then a better question is, what should we sell to this mod? It's just this... this number. I would think so. There's some tricky stuff when we start doing it with doubles. That's, like, beyond the scope of the, like, the curriculum stuff, but... That's not quite what we expected, probably, right? Yeah, the result is, yeah. Um, we're going to stick to integers, but yes, it has uses when it comes to, to doubles. And I guess related to that, because some of you might have, have used this in, in your math class, the behavior of the mod operator with negative numbers is different in Java than it is in math class. So just watch out for that, too. That's not going to come up in this class, but sometimes students run into it with their own things that they're doing. All right, so let's actually use this. Let's, let's use this to calculate our leftover seconds. Let's create a new variable called leftover seconds. And that's going to be, we're basically doing the same operands, total seconds and seconds for every minute. But instead of doing integer division, we're going to do the mod operator. So total seconds mod seconds for every minute. And so again, if total seconds is 130, seconds for every minute is 60, 130 mod 60 is gonna give us 10 leftover seconds, which is perfect. So this is good. Um, but we also want to know how many whole hours we have and how many leftover minutes and how many whole days we have and how many leftover hours and how many whole years we have and leftover days. That's a lot of code to type and it's basically the same two lines of code over and over again. So we're not gonna waste time altogether typing that out. Instead, if you go to Canvas and you go to our announcements, the most recent announcement is a code snippet of the rest of the code we need for doing all these conversions. So you can just copy this out of Canvas <coughs> and paste it right here. So it's the same integer division, mod operator, integer division, mod operator, integer division, mod operator. And then we build up a really nice description string that says, hey, it's going to take this many years and days and hours and minutes and seconds. Perfect. So copy and paste that from, from Canvas.